Welcome to 80s TV Ladies, the podcast that looks at female-driven TV shows from the 1980s. I'm Sharon Johnson. And I'm Susan Lambert-Haddam. We're your hosts today, talking about ladies of the 80s television style. Now, last time, we just started our dive into the action comedy show, Scarecrow and Mrs. King, starring Kate Jackson and Bruce Boxleitner. Today, we're going to continue our examination of this 80s female-driven show. So welcome to Season 1, Episode 2 of 80s TV Ladies, or as I like to refer to this episode, Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. We're going to be looking at the first season of four seasons. This season ran from October 3rd, 1983 to May 7th, 1984. The show is about a divorced mother of two who is unexpectedly drafted into working for a government agency and becomes a spy. Today, we're going to look at a couple of key episodes in season one that I think stand out for a few reasons and talk a little bit about the change in showrunners that happened mid-season. A little bit unusual for a television show, though not unheard of, but we're also going to look at an injury on set and it affected a couple of episodes that came after. But before we get into all of that, a little housekeeping. If you want to find out more about us or the TV shows we're talking about, go to our website. 80stvladies.com. You can check out episodes. Let us know what your favorite ladies of the 80s television shows are. And um, let us know what you think we should be talking about. Like what determines an 80s TV lady show? Let's get into it. Let's do it. Oh, it's fun to be a mom and it's fun to be a spy. It's fun to be a spy and a mom. It's fun to be a mom and it's fun to be a spy. It's fun to be a spy and a mom. In this season, Kate Jackson got injured. She apparently tore all the ligaments in her ankle Ow. Um, jumping um, down some stairs. Now, I haven't been able to determine what part. I was sort of looking closely at some of those early episodes. We know that in episode six, the episode we're going to talk about today, Kate Jackson is wearing a big boot on her leg. So my guess is that episode five is when she injured it and they probably had to shoot around her. So I think there is a lot of the next few episodes in those early, in the early part of the season where there's a lot of Kate Jackson sitting on a desk, Kate Jackson driving in a car. I can only imagine how difficult it must have been for production in, for a show that was still kind of finding its way as new shows. It takes a while to kind of everybody get in a rhythm and everything and to have one of your leads be injured in that way and their mobility be hampered in that way and and all the difficulties that that must have caused. Well, and it's not just a drama. So it's it it is an a- action was a big part of the of the season, one of the most fun parts of the season, I thought. I thought the stunts in season 1 and season 2 were pretty pretty strong. So in episode 6, which is also called Always Look a Gift Horse in the Mouth. I'm going to synopsize this for us. So Amanda uh must befriend Princess Penny a U.S. citizen who's married to a prince from a foreign country and their lives are threatened when they visit the United States. So Lee and Amanda have to protect them. And uh, somehow they end up on a ranch and they're on a horse and all of this with apparently Kay Jackson in a boot. So most of it's her stunt woman on a horse, I think. But uh, what I did find really great is there's this moment where Kate Jackson, as Amanda King, has to be at the fancy party with the prince and princess. And she's in her nice dress, but she's got this big, old, awkward boot on her leg. And they sort of write it off as she injured it, teaching the boys, her boys, how to uh, slide into, you know, home base. To me, it is very much sort of in character, right? Right. Because she's still very awkward. She's still a housewife who's not used to this sort of highfalutin spy world. And so she feels very awkward. And that in itself itself is a physical embodiment of her awkwardness. And so I actually thought it really worked for the show. I give credit to the writers for that, for coming up with a, a reason for it that was very much in character. It's not always easy to work something like that into a show and I think they did a a good job with it and I don't know that they really spent a lot of time sort of 
mentioning it beyond that, perhaps they had to do it in this show because they were so far into production for it and they had no choice. They couldn't find another way around to try to figure out or how to shoot this thing without letting you see that she had this big boot thing on her on her foot. So, And I give her credit, too, for soldiering on. I mean, she must have been in a lot of pain. I've never torn ligaments in my ankle, but it sounds really painful. I don't know if we'll ever get to talk to her, but she really... Um you know, kind of had her pick coming off of Charlie's Angels of what she was going to do. And so I think she was looking for a half hour comedy is what I've read, but then came across the script and I think was really charmed by the script and by the sort of romantic action spy detective duo is sort of something, again, you see it every once in a while. I think the Mr. and Mrs. Smith, like, wasn't there that Mm -hmm. uh, movie? But the action comedy and television has really gone by the wayside and and I kind of miss it. I kind of um, also miss the um, buddy comedy and even the romantic comedy. I'm a big Dashiell Hammett fan who wrote not only uh, the Maltese Falcon, but he also wrote the Thin Man series. And that was a husband and wife getting drunk and solving crimes <laughs> <laughs> and having a grand old time. The other thing that I liked about this episode is they had um, a guest star, Jane Kaczmarek, who would go on to have a very long and successful TV and f- film career, still does. She's most notably known now, I think, as being Malcolm's mom from Malcolm in the Middle, Lois. And in 1983, she starred not only in A Scarecrow, Mrs. King, but also a Remington Steele episode. And she did like a three show arc on St. Elsewhere. So I thought that was cool. It's always nice when you're like, oh, wait, look, that's her. That's it. Who's that? (laughs) It's one of the fun things about this show. The, hey, it's that guy or hey, it's that woman um, that uh, that comes up as you as you watch the show. Somebody then who, like Jane, was just maybe starting their career, but now is much more well known. Um, It's kind of fun. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I mean, you see that a lot in a lot of the 80s. And they just, it's amazing how many times they actually use the same actor to play different characters on a, on the same show, which is sort of weird. Like you'd never be able to do that now. And also just how many character actors you saw and that were just in everything. So the other, one of the other um, guest actors in this show is Richard Narita, who um, is a Japanese American actor who is you know, in so many shows from the 70s and 80s. What's notable for me is he he actually played an agent. He played uh, IFF agent Dane, and he's actually in two episodes. So when those happened, you know, I was really sort of hoping they'd keep bringing back and really identify other agents in the agency besides the core group of Francine and Lee and and Amanda. Um, They don't. (laughs) <laughs> but it was it was interesting to note for me that it was, again, one of the few agents of color in the show. So I appreciated that. Oh, there was one other thing I had to say <laughs> about uh, uh, Richard Narita, because, again, this is what I was saying, like these these uh, character actors would basically just be in everything. Right. They'd get cast in one show and then another show and then another show. And so in that same time period, right before he did this this these two episodes of Scarecrow and Mrs. King, he actually was in two shows that were on the year before Scarecrow and Mrs. King, The Tales of the Gold Monkey and its counterpart called Bring Him Back Alive. But that Bring Him Back Alive show starred, yes, Bruce Boxleitner. I think uh, Richard Narita went on to do a couple of Magnum PIs and um and again just just he's got a list of of credits. There's a lot more of that cross-pollination, if you will, going on then than maybe there is now, I think. Or maybe it was just because there were fewer networks. There it's it's easier to to see that they the the work that character actors like that are doing when because now it's impossible to see everything. So Yeah, but I don't think like I think I, I think you're right. It's really hard to do that, I think now. You really want to get yourself on a show and stay there if you're an actor. So again, those were my notable thoughts about that episode. The other thing is it was written by Peter uh, Lefcourt, who wrote a lot of 70s and 80s shows and wrote a lot of Scarecrow. He, he, he wrote two of the uh, episodes we're talking about today. Well, as it happens, he also wrote the episode that's one of my favorites from that season. It's episode 13. 
It's called I Am Not, Nor Have I Ever Been a Spy. And in this episode, Amanda has partial memory loss and doesn't remember working for the IFS. She and Lee go to a hot dog stand to pick up a note from a source. It's a a drop that he's used for a long time with this source. But unbeknownst to them, there's some terrorists who've sort of figured it out and, and are waiting to intercept the note when Scarecrow picks it up. They don't know whether Scarecrow is a man or woman. They just know that this person's coming. So when she picks up the order due to circumstances, um, they grab her, throw her in their car, and off they go. I mean, Lee tries to chase them down, but uh, but isn't able to. And then when they're interrogating her, it was when she utters the, the famous line that is the title of this episode. And she manages to escape and in doing so, hops into the car that they stole, that they used to to kidnap her and gets in a crash, which causes her to lose her memory. So the rest of the show is her memory kind of slowly piecemeal coming back so they can try to figure out what happened or what it is these guys were up to and try to try to stop them. And as I think about it, too, I, I realize how little let's say walking around she did, despite the fact that she was kidnapped. She had a lot of sitting in chairs, laying in hospital beds, that kind of thing. So um, clearly, I I would imagine she was still suffering from her injury at that point too, but you would not have known if you didn't know. Yeah, the only time you see the boot is is in that uh, that one episode, but I think it definitely stayed with her. That's not an injury you get over uh, very quickly. But I also like that episode because it's very it's very funny. I mean, it Mm -hmm. is once again Amanda in the wrong place (laughs) at the right time. (laughs) And what I love about the show is is all the spy stuff. Right? It is. This season is mistaken identity. Like she's mistaken for Scarecrow several times this season. And also there's a lot of, you know, twins in this season. There's a lot of Francine looks like a, a Hungarian refugee um, in one episode. And, and there's an episode where someone turns themselves in to look just like Amanda so that they can betray, Amanda can betray Lee and, and he has to figure out there's two Amandas. One good and one evil. And, um, <laughs> um, which is that like fun, you know, kind of very, this, this season's very goofy, but it really does rely upon the charm of them. And I think there's a lot of charm in that moment where he's really, um, very upset that she doesn't remember him and, uh, and doesn't remember that, uh, she's been involved with him in the spy game for, you know, what, 12 episodes at that point. And I also, I there's, and also in this episode, there's still the, let's call it subplot of her boyfriend, Dean. Um, she was supposed to have lunch with his mother that day. And of course, getting kidnapped and losing her memory. She missed it. The Dean we never really see. And um, I think at some point he just sort of disappears from the scene, but, um, and, and rightly so. But at this point, there was still this attempt by the show to sort to separate her life before she met um, Scarecrow from her life after. Um, her mother never quite figures out in the show that she was a spy or is a spy, but she was still trying to maintain this sort of bifurcation of her life and, and in terms of her romantic life, at least at that point. Yes, the double life. It is sort of that the secret. And it, it I mean, I, I joke that, you know, in this show, it's it's all about how much uh, fun it is to be a spy and a mom and because they I and I, I think they were pretty successful season one with doing that balance like she is trying to balance you know a hectic home life and personal life with this new career and I, and I think that's one of the things that really struck me uh, again watching it you know as a much younger person and again more seeing my mom in that character than than myself but Definitely seeing that balance of, oh, I want to do something important in the world, but I also want to have my family and my family is important too. And and there's a lot of back and forth on that in this season and in that episode because she's she can't believe that she would be doing that. And she's got this home life that, you know, is what she truly wants to do, sort of, maybe kind of. Well, I think she she at this point is still trying to figure out, you know, she's got this this exciting new career that fell into her lap literally. Plus she had this life that she had before that I think she was fairly satisfied with and now she's trying to figure out how to how to make those two things mesh. Um and 
it's something I think that that we all have to do in our lives, and it's, and it's certainly a bigger issue in some career choices as others. And I'd imagine trying to be a spy it would be really, really hard. So I, I like that aspect of this of this episode as well. You know, and so they play with this: is she going to stay in this job? And it's clearly a job that she is enjoying and that she is liking and and choosing. And that, so that's why I think it really is. This is a show very much driven by Mrs. King's choices. This is a, this is a female driven show. And um, there weren't a lot of those. Um, and she, you know, it, it definitely becomes about her and Scarecrow and her and Lee Stetson, but it's really because she is saying, no, I'm going to keep showing up and keep doing this. And and so one of my favorite episodes is uh, episode 10. If we jump back to it, also written by Peter Lovecourt. Peter Lovecourt wrote not only on Scarecrow Mrs. King um, and several episodes, obviously, all that we're talking about. Um, he also wrote on Cagney and Lacey, Eight is Enough, uh, and even uh, wrote into uh, this uh, time of Desperate Housewives. So he wrote a lot of television and movies. Um, he's gone on to write novels, and uh, one of the people that um, we'll try to track down and see if we can talk to talk to him. Uh, episode 10 of season one, it's about a burnt out double agent who knows too many secrets, who's offering to turn himself into the U.S. in order to to, to the IFF agency. Um, uh, but he'll only do it if if the agency finds his long lost daughter. And uh, it's Christmas Eve and they can't find her. And they're running out of time. Uh, so, of course, they come up with the brilliant idea that Amanda is the perfect person to play the long lost daughter uh, in order to convince him to sort of um, come and, and and kind of get relocated for, for good in the U.S. and tell all his secrets and keep all the U.S. secrets he knows. So, Lee and Amanda have to hike to the remote cabin where he's hiding and um, and... And Lee promises that she'll be back by four in time to do Christmas Eve with her kids. But meanwhile, the KGB, who doesn't want this guy to give up all his secrets, has sent two killers to take out the guy. And then Lee gets shot and Amanda has to save the day. And she does it by being uh, by sort of leaning into I'm going to be a decent human being. So uh, Lee gets shot and one of the KGB guys gets shot. And so she actually finally decides that the only way to help them is to go and get the first aid kit that's back at the car. And, um, and it's cold and it's Christmas Eve. And so she walks out and then basically is like, uh, sure, she's going to get shot by the surviving KGB guy. But she basically pleads with him by being a decent human being and talking about her kids and her family and how she just wants to go get the first aid kit and come back. And if if the two KGB officers want to wait in the cabin, then they can all get the first aid kit and all be okay for a minute and sort of have a little detente. And it works. And so then she ends up spending Christmas Eve in a cabin with three agents and some vodka and um, <laughs> and uh, and sort of cracks the hardened hearts of all the agents. And they actually have this lovely Christmas Eve uh, moment. And so she doesn't make it home in time for Christmas Eve, but she does make it back to her couch in time for Christmas morning with her kids. So that that to me is a very is a very like in some ways bottle episode like it pretty much all takes place at the cabin, mm-hmm. but it's a very successful um, for me uh, episode because I think they're both very charming in that episode and and it plays to here's how a housewife with her um, hiking skills from scouting and and her human skills from hey maybe we don't all have to be on opposing sides all the time works bit of a fantasy but i like that well if we you know if we wanted realism we could watch the news where we're hoping to be entertained by watching the tv show and and i think um this show certainly does that this episode as well it's very it's very it's a very good episode i agree yeah so those those are sort of my some of my favorites and then um but then a big thing was happening in the show sometime around episode 12 and 13 Eugenie Ross Lemming and Brad Bruckner, who created the show and ran the show, clearly are asked to step down, I'm assuming, or they leave the show themselves, um, because a new showrunner comes on, Juanita Bartlett. This was a show where I recognized 
in watching it, when I was first watching it, the fact that there was a female showrunner really stood out to me. And I didn't notice that truly until the Juanita Bartlett side of the of the series. And I'm not sure if it was because it was Eugenia Ross Lemming and Brad Buckner and those names were sort of kind of thrown together and really long, long. And I just read Brad Buckner, mm-hmm. you know, and and it wasn't until it was just the name Juanita Bartlett or if it's just Juanita Bartlett's kind of a beautiful, lovely, interesting name. And so, but I distinctly remember watching this show and suddenly around the middle of the season going, wait, this is run by a woman. I was just starting to pay attention to who wrote and directed these things, to who made these shows. Um, and and I, I sort of ended up becoming a big fan of Juanita Bartlett and I don't think she gets enough attention as an early female showrunner but also just as a as a writer and TV writer she had an amazing career and you don't hear about it that much she um, was a brilliant writer and producer she really started early on she started on Nichols James Gardner show and started as an assistant, as, as as James Garner's secretary. But she basically went to the producer of Nichols and, you know, and pitched an idea for the show. And he was like, okay, well, why don't you write it? And she did, and everybody liked it. And so she, you know, it really um, kind of shifted. I mean, she really was interested in writing television and pursued it at a time that there weren't a lot of that. And then pursued it at a very high level because she went on to basically be a significant writer um, and producer on the Rockford Files. Um, she went on to um, uh, write for Greatest American Hero. She wrote a lot with Cannell, uh, Stephen J. Cannell. Um, so she worked on Ten Speed and Brown Shoe and with Scarecrow Mrs. King. She went on to produce um, In the Heat of the Night. Uh, with Carol O'Connor. And it, so she had this kind of amazing career and then kind of disappeared. And, um, and no one ever heard about her. Uh, and not as much as you hear about the David Chases and, and obviously Stephen J. Cannell, but she worked very closely with Stephen Cannell. And so, um, I'd always sort of been really fascinated by her. My husband, too, who's a big Rockford Files fan. And so one year we're in New York. So this is my Winnie to Bartlett story. We ready? Excited? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, we are visiting New York, and um, and and we start. We're talking about Winnie Bartlett, walking the streets of New York, and um, and we realize she lives in New York, and so we decide to look her up. So we basically, you know, Google Winnie Bartlett, and basically end up finding a phone number for Winnie Bartlett, and this is twenty thirteen. Wow. Well, I mean, Barlow's pretty old, mm-hmm. but we reach her. We call her and we reach her and we basically are like, hey, we're big fans. We're in New York. Um, we'd love to take you to coffee or something. And we never do this. Like, I've never done this. She's super lovely. She sounds pretty old and sh- and 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 it happens that the time that we're there is this giant snowstorm in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately we're going to, we we set this date and the next day basically we call her and she's like I am not leaving my apartment. It is a very cold and snowy out there. <laughs> and we're like we totally understand that. We're sorry. Um but we'll be back. And when we come back, can we call you and and do this again? And she says, "Yes." So we Leave New York, come back to LA, and we're like, okay, next time we're in New York, we're going to do this. And then Juanita Bartlett dies in 2014, and we don't get to um, see Juanita Bartlett and meet her. Um, So uh, that's our, we almost met Juanita Bartlett, and I think we would have been just real um, total goofballs if we had, and she probably would have thought we were crazy and a little bit stalkery. I have a feeling she would have loved it. Um, maybe so. Maybe so. So I have a very fond uh, uh, thoughts of Juanita Bartlett. And I think that's a beautiful time to take a break. So we'll take a little break and we'll be back to talk about more of season one. Hello and welcome back to 80s TV Ladies um, and joining us for the second half is going to be a very special guest. Um, we have Richard Haddam. 
Okay, let's be honest. It's not that special. I just walked in from the house. <laughs> okay. I've come all the also, way from my office to your office. He is also my husband. Here. <laughs> Full disclosure. And I'm honored to be here, 80s TV ladies. Yay. Richard, thank you. Richard is also um, uh, I just a want the listener to know that, uh, that I have endured many, many hours of 80s television with Susan and uh, and so I, I I feel spiritually that I too am an '80s TV lady. <laughs> you are spiritually an '80s TV lady. Uh, we this this podcast definitely started because during pandemic, uh, Rich and I started watching uh, like just consuming '80s television shows like they were bags of potato chips. Yeah, well, and- it was it was Hardcastle and McCormick we started with because that's our show. Some people have a song, we have a show, and that show is Hardcastle and McCormick. So you know, send your send your thoughts and prayers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? Everybody needs a show. Um, so, uh, but. Uh, we have brought Richard on because he's also a television writer and screenwriter. He wrote The Mothman Prophecies, one of my favorite movies. Um, and uh, um, it is, he's laughing, but it's true. It's Look, let's get to the chase. I, I, I'm here to discuss leg injuries on the set. I understand, but we have to give you your credits. Um, so he's written a lot of television, a lot, a lot, a lot of television. I'm sure he'll talk about some of them because one is involves an injury. And but uh, he's currently on uh, HBO Max Titans. Yeah, season I am. Four. He's working on season four. <laughs> I've never for the for those of you listening who know me, you know that I've never seen a season four of anything. Uh, this is this is the first time I've been on a show longer than one season. Um, in fact, thinking about the season uh, of the show that I did with the leg injury, or, can, can we talk about it? Or do you, okay. you want to? Yeah, so we brought him on it? specifically to talk about leg injuries on set. <laughs> I was because, told I would be discussing a leg injury because we were talking I'm about. I'm prepared Kate, to discuss leg injuries. Kate Jackson was injured on the set of Scarecrow Mrs. King. She was the lead. She was a producer on the show and she was injured in episode five, we think, right. of the show. Right. I remember watching that one. Do you, But do we know how she got injured? She was during it, uh, apparently during the episode. I don't know if they were shooting, but she basically like kind of jumped down like two stairs. You know, she jumped yeah. downstairs. It wasn't a, a huge deal. stunt, but it was a bit of a action. And, um, and, and and apparently her ankle went pop pop pop, and she tore all the ligaments in her ankle. <laughs> that sounds like magnitude from Community. <laughs> pop pop. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's funny that, that you know it wasn't like you know jumping out of a moving car, no. you know, or something like that. Um, so uh, in 2012 and 2013, I worked on Grimm. And when we were watching Scarecrow and Mrs. King and, you know, she had her leg injury, it didn't occur to me for a while that that had actually been a part of my experience on my episode. So this was, I wrote four episodes. This was the fourth of the four episodes, one angry Fuchs bow. And, um, and I was there. So when you do, typically when you're writing for, an hour long TV show, the writer of that episode will go to the set when it's being filmed, wherever that happens to be. In this case, it was Grimm. So it was Portland, Oregon. So of course, Susan remembers me going away for weeks on end. Actually going away for Grimm wasn't that long. No, it was just a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. The, the, the trips to uh, Toronto for, um, for Titans, those stretch out for what feels like months. But anyway, so I'm up there. It's, um, January, February of 2013. And we're in the middle of filming. So we've started filming the episode, but now it's a weekend. It happens to be Super Bowl weekend. So Akela was up there, Akela Cooper, um, because I think her episode was either coming up. I guess she was prepping her episode, which was going to film next. And um, so a bunch of us went to a local Portland bar and uh, watch the Super Bowl. So it was me and Akela and Silas and Claire and David and Bree. So he's th- throwing out cast members. So these things, you know, the, like, the, 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 like he's, you know, on a first name basis totally with who played oh, wait, Nick he and is. Claire Coffey, who played um, uh, the Hex and Beast, and uh, and um, Silas, who played Monroe, was there, and and then um, and the guy who played the captain, uh, Sasha, he was there. So, but but they were just coming in. So you got to realize how fun it is. First of all. 
Portland, not a lot of shows filmed in Portland, but Grimm was filming there, filmed at a lot of actual locations, and the city loved them. The cast were heroes. So, you know, if you were going to go have dinner with, you know, Bitsy Tullock or something, you didn't have to worry about making the reservation and neither did she because you would just show up at a restaurant and they'd be like, Bitsy, come on in, come on in. We got a table for you. I mean, it was such a like a hometown crowd. And anyways, so we're sitting in the middle of this big sports bar at these big long tables and everyone around recognizes the cast of Grimm from the show and from the city. And they're kind of like you know, some of them are coming up and can you sign this? And the cast is doing that. Anyway, it was really fun. Silas and I, I remember were betting on everything, like literally betting on, okay, you know, how long, you know, but, but, you know, who's going to win the coin toss. Okay. Who's going to score first. Okay. Now, like what's the commercial going to be? I mean, just money was flying back and forth. I have pictures of us like literally throwing money at each other. But anyway, one person's not at the party, Russell Hornsby. Where's Russell? Russell played, uh, Nick's partner. And, um, and he was, uh, he was at his own party. Okay. He was, up in Portland with, I, I think his wife was up there and he was, you know, they were just watching the game. He's like, I don't want to, I just want to kind of keep it chill. So he's at home watching the game, wherever he lived, probably they rented an apartment for him or whatever. Anyway, so he, um, at some point watching the game, he jumps up off the couch <laughs> and tears his Achilles tendon. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. It's always something so innocuous like that. No, right. not rescuing a child from, you know, a no. burning building or something. No, no. Or a big stunt. Yes. And, you know, it wasn't one of the million stunts he does on the show. It was just, it was just, it, it wasn't even on the show. It was at home. So later that night, we, you know, I get the email. Okay. He's injured. He's at the hospital where we've got our eye on him. Okay. So Monday morning, we all show up on set. He's there too, but he's got the big boot on and he's on some painkillers and he's on crutches. And it's like, well, what are we going to do? We'd already filmed half the episode. You can't write in the injury to take place during that episode. So what we had to do was just, it's like, okay, in the scene where we thought he was going to be standing, he'll be sitting. And in the scene that we thought we were going to film between, you know, the, the, the two characters walking down the stairs, well, well, David Gentoli will just arrive at the bottom of the stairs and, uh, you know, Hank will already be there and they'll just talk at the bottom of the stairs. And they even did things where he would lean into shots. So it looked like he had just walked up, even though he was just sort of leaning back, you know, just right off camera. And then David would step in. And then he would lean in and it looked like they both walked up to the spot they were at. So they had all these ways of getting him through that particular episode. So he concluded that episode, One Angry Fuchs Bow, season two, episode 17, with the audience believing he was fine, even though he was injured. Then the next episode, he wasn't in at all because he had to get surgery. And that's the one where they wrote it in. They wrote, oh, well, he's on vacation in Hawaii. And then when he came back, he was still on crutches from his surgery. So they said, oh, he was injured zip lining in Hawaii when he was on vacation. Oh, so it wasn't part. It wasn't like, oh, he got a fight in the show and then he's injured. No, 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 no. Because okay. be, because they couldn't they couldn't stage a fight because by then he was injured. injured. So it was like, you know what? We know he has to have surgery. Let's just not, you know, let's not freak him out. Let's not freak production out. Let him take a couple of weeks off get the surgery, rest up however much he can. They said, oh yeah, no, he'll be, he'll be able to rejoin. He'll be okay. He'll be out of bed, but he'll be on crutches. Okay. So he's going to miss a week of shooting and he's going to return on crutches. All right. He went on vacation, got injured in some crazy way. And uh, now he's back. And then he came back and uh, concluded the rest of the season. I would have been more proud of you if you had basically made it that he got injured teaching his kids how to slide into home base. <laughs> if only. Like yeah. on if Scarecrow, only. Mrs. King. If, if only we had the deep mythological machinery in place to, <laughs> to, to also make Hank a great dad. But unfortunately, I, I actually think he was, va- the, the storyline was he was vacationing with his ex-wife. 
because apparently Hank had like more than one ex-wife on the show. Like it was very weird kind of what they were doing with, with his backstory. But uh, that that's the story was, yeah, he was in vacationing with an ex-wife, injured himself zip lining. That is so great. And yeah. then and so how many episodes did you have to accommodate that injury? You know, I don't know, because that was right at the end of the season. That was my oh. final episode in terms of writing. And then uh, Jim and David wrote like the last few episodes of the season, which they typically would do. Usually the end of the season was a two parter and they would write it. So by the time I got back from Portland, the writer's room had been disbanded for the season because it's like, okay, we've broken all the stories and now it's just a matter of, you know, David and Jim finishing up. And so, so I was basically on break and then, um, and then that was the end of season two. And then I didn't come back for season three. So that was really the last thing that happened to me on the show was witnessing uh, Russell uh, trying to negotiate around uh, with, with a giant boot on his leg. Oh, man. Well, thank goodness he didn't have some giant stunt he was supposed to do in that episode that it was everything oh, yeah. was able. He was able to accommodate, you know, that way. And there were episodes he did. In fact, episodes that I wrote where he had to do big stunts like the Bigfoot episode. He had big stunts and the um, bad moon rising. I mean, there, I mean, they did stunts. There was things to do on the show. Um, but it's, it's, it makes you think what a miracle it is that people aren't getting injured like that all the time, especially when it's just like walking downstairs or jumping up off a couch. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you know, Titans, big stunts every show year after year after year. And really, in terms of our main cast, no one has been injured to the point where they where it has to be written into the show that, you know, okay, here's why this person can't (laughs) can't walk without a limp anymore. Okay, we're going to knock on some wood. We're going to let Kevin know we're about to knock on some wood for you because, you know, you're about. Oh, now that I've mentioned it, I've totally jinxed it. it. I think you've totally jinxed (laughs) it. Probably, probably. Um, You know, so we've been talking about um, Kate Jackson's injury, um, uh, but it also leads to this discussion about sort of actors' reputations. And um, and because. Like reputations on set, like are they hard to work with? Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. Well, so the rumor coming off of Charlie's Angels was that Kate Jackson was difficult. For some reason, the rumor uh, like about Kate Jackson on Charlie's Angels was she was difficult. Now, Charlie's Angels was pretty much created for Kate Jackson. Right. And so... Well, that doesn't help. <laughs> that makes me believe the rumor. Who started the rumor? Where the, who you hear the rumor from? This, no, it just, it was sort of like a known thing. It was sort of like in, you know... I don't know, in TV Guide or in, you know, certain things. This was kind of a known thing. And but it wasn't was, her like apart from the other ones. Like it's like, oh, Fair Fawcett was well, great. They oh, also, yeah, Jacqueline Smith. There was also dream. this sort of rumor that was, again, sort of disproven that that they didn't get along, that uh, mm-hmm. the angels themselves, oh. actress wise, didn't get along. But they remained friends for a long, long time. They were all, you know, like they were they they each refuted those rumors. But you're talking about a show where it became a super hit, super fast. Right. It it became part of the culture. It became part of the culture. culture But it also, like, people were leaving the show. Like, Fair Fawcett only was in season one of that show. And because they didn't have a renewal for her and then wouldn't negotiate at the level she wanted to negotiate, that's why she left the show. Right. Well, also, but and she was the breakout star and they wanted her to do movies and she figured, OK, I've got it. She was the Chevy Chase. You know, she was like, hey, I, I got famous, did one year on the show. Now I'm going to go be in movies. I think back then movies were still the big draw. Yeah. It's like if I could get out of this and go do movies, you'd be crazy not to. Actors having an opinion can sound difficult sometimes, I think, on a show, <laughs> period. But I think it was because. She was an opinionated, smart woman who had an idea about what she wanted from her character and from that show and was very clear about it um, because that was very clear in Scarecrow. When you read those sort of behind the scenes stuff on Scarecrow, they talk about like she's an incredibly hard worker. She is very like working at a very high level and And basically, if you want to call that difficult, then that's difficult, but that's just, or you call it 
like super professional. Well, if, no. Well, if, if it's a woman, now it's a problem. Well, certainly know. in the eighties. Yeah. I, or I, now. I, you know, and, and it might, well, you know. Well, how often have you heard stories of difficult male actors on shows? And you can't, it's always about the women who are difficult on a show. And it's very rarely from from that that there are men that are difficult in the pop culture, like you know, in the right. publications. You exactly. don't hear about it. Exactly, I've heard about it, but well, it never personally gets out. from people. Yeah, like where it's like, oh wait, that person on that show. Well, I was just listening to um, another podcast. They were talking about Columbo and Peter Falk and how, like, it was the number one show on NBC. And Universal's like, we just want to stop. It's it's too expensive because Peter Falk is too problematic. I mean, and it became well known again at that at that time. Right. You know, we didn't have you know immediate access to all information as we do now. But he was a huge pain in the ass. And I mean, I could go through and name so many people on so many shows, as you know. I mean, you know, all of our favorite shows. We found out those those guys weren't necessarily the easiest to work with. No, and, yeah, but that's that's exactly the point, though, because it because it made it into the press or made it known outside of the industry about all these women who were difficult. But you rarely heard those kinds of things about men who were equally, if not more, difficult or hard to work with, etc. I can't. I mean, I can't think of many, if any. I mean, I never heard that about Peter Falk, for instance. I think back to when Desperate Housewives was big and there was a lot of talk in the press about how they all didn't get along. I I find it hard to believe that there weren't other shows on ABC where there were men that didn't get along. And yet, you you rarely have ever heard about it. It's weird. It's not as as sort of, um, you go back to movies, like like if you heard that John Wayne was hard to work with, you'd go, yeah, that figures, you know, mm-hmm. guy seems like a son of a bitch, you know, but all anyone wants to talk about are Betty Davis. You right. know, it's somehow just like, it's like more compelling to hear that. And I, I don't know. I, I mean, obviously it has something to do with the fact that they're women. I don't know if it, if it's like, oh, because it's, it's a, a you know, a, a kind of misogyny or if it's just, we perceive of female stars in a particular way. Betty Davis, I guess you're not surprised, but if there's a a female star who presents as non-aggressive and friendly and funny and goofy, and then, and then you hear, Oh my God, she's a monster. Then it's like, Oh my God. You know, what do we think our icon dreams have been shattered or something? But, but I, I think where you're going is that those rumors weren't true. She was just, she was a producer on the show. She was a producer on the show. She helped create the show. So what's funny is, so there was, um, uh, again, in order to kind of research this stuff, like it's basically TV guides, <laughs> Starlog magazines. Uh, right. And, and very reliable, very reliable sources. Um, but even as like, I think that like, so one of the TV guide, uh, um, references that I found when I was Googling um, uh, Kate Jackson and Scarecrow Mrs. King was was literally someone writing into TV Guide in like 2007 what? <laughs> and saying, well, I heard Kate Jackson was difficult on uh, uh, Charlie's Angels. Did she learn her lesson and change her ways for Scarecrow Mrs. King? <laughs> Signed, Jacqueline Smith. <laughs> <laughs> and and thankfully, the uh, answer was like, well, let's talk about this for a minute <laughs> and actually sort of address the fact that, um, you know, being, you know, that she was a producer on the show and that she was, uh, you know, actually n- not known to be difficult and on Charlie's Angels in retrospect when it comes out that like, right. actually, they're really like nobody really pointed to anything. Right. Um and I'm sure the standard was much higher. I'm sure, again, within the business, there was, a, a, I, my guess is that women had to be a lot more concerned with how they were coming off. I think they still do in so many ways. And, 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 us, and women of color, especially, we, I've seen it numerous times where, where some, it, it will become clear someone will inform me typically because I'm a white man on the set, but someone will inform me that that actress that you're you know that you're dealing with and that you think is great is great 
But one of the reasons is because that person feels they have to be extra careful not to be seen as anything other than 100% cooperative and friendly and ready to work because people will believe the reputation so mm-hmm. quickly. And those are people who are going to hire you or not hire you. And I'm sure Kate Jackson, although she was doing well, didn't want a reputation and had to worry about it in a way that other people didn't. Clearly, Peter Falk was not worried about his next job. No. So I, I so I'm going to read a little Kate Jackson quote from uh, a TV Guide in 1984. Um, so this is uh, Kate Jackson, who played housewife turned spy Amanda King, told TV Guy in 1984, "Yes, I had my say about Charlie's Angels. Why is that such a big deal? <laughs> We're not robots, though some people would like that." I was getting up at four or five in the morning, pouring my life into it. TNA, that's all anybody wanted to talk about, but I knew we had to have story and character. What's TNA? Okay, now you're just being funny. (laughs) I I think maybe some people don't know what you're referring to. Uh, The Charlie's Angels was known as TNA television, which is nuts. And I don't know if we can say that on a podcast, but it's mine. So I think I can. Well, you're pouring your life into it. I'm pouring my life into it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> her attitude did indeed carry over to scarecrow and the actress saw no need to back away from it i work 12 or 14 hours a day she said i'm working it's saturday night and that's why i can get so distressed and crazy and start yelling and screaming at the studio <laughs> <laughs> we gotta do this we gotta do that they were i'm giving on, my life to this business they were working on a saturday night apparently so Wow. Let's make it as good as we can. I'm sure some people think of me as a pain, but when you have 13 weeks at best, you can lose an audience very quickly. Yeah. And I, guar- I can't afford that. I, I guarantee George Papard never, never felt he had to explain why he was the way he was right. on the set of the A team. Everyone just knew. <laughs> Famously, again, you didn't hear about it in the trades or in. You know, pop culture magazines of the time, but I know for a fact that uh, on the A team, they basically could not put George Papard and Mr. T in the same scenes for a lot of the later seasons. Oh, of yeah. The A team. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and difficult. And look, I mean, difficult can, can express itself in many ways. Difficult can be we can't film after lunch with a particular actor, and I'm not talking about George Papard, but. Well, this particular actor likes to drink his lunch, so make sure you get all his scenes in the morning because he will be of no use to you in the afternoon. These are major network stars. I'm not going to name names, but man, you know who these people are. If I named the names, you'd go, you kidding me? And it's like, nope. They, it was, it, it was an effort to get them on set sober. And this goes all the way back in Hollywood. But again, well, it'd be, it wouldn't be right to talk about men that way. Come on. Because men are running the studio. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, 80s TV ladies. Hate to be the one to <laughs> bring the room down. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Richard, for coming on to explain misogyny to us. <laughs> ladies, let me explain misogyny. Now, there's this thing. <laughs> Actually, no, it, it, it is it, it it is what it was and it is what it is. There's no question about it. And and it's it's nice to think that as we go forward, some of this will change. And also, as we look back, that there'll be a reexamination of people like Kate Jackson and a, a recognition that whatever reputation she had for being difficult, was it earned? Was it really, you know, it, was it was she someone who. Again, couldn't uh, couldn't film afternoon or was she just someone just was like, we need to make it better. Well, I mean, I think she was. We need to make it better. Everything you hear is not she wasn't being difficult because she didn't want to show up or she I mean, she was clearly showing up with her, you know, a broken, broken foot. And she clearly was trying to show up in later seasons when things got really dark for her. Um uh, with a serious cancer diagnosis. Um, so, but again, you weren't allowed, you know, kind of to show, show fear or injury, right? Mm-hmm. And you're certainly not allowed to show an emotion and being overly passionate about uh, a piece if I, you're not as much well, allowed if you're a woman. And, and, and it's just, and, and it's or still, now. And it's still, 
it's still a culture that isn't used to hearing from women from a place of power. So, and I, I'm talking about from the heads of the studios all the way down to the guys working on the set. It, it's, it hits different and, and people's level of maturity is not always what you want it to be. So what, you know, someone who is aggressive and they're a man is just, you know, you hear this all the time with directors, male directors come on set and are absolute tyrants, but the crew is okay with that because they're used to it. So it's just like, well, he knows what he wants. But if a female director comes in and has that same level of energy and demand of here's what it's going to be, that's uncomfortable because they're not used to that and they characterize it in a different way. That person's a bitch. You know, oh, look out. This one's you. Oh, do, you don't want to get on her wrong side, you know, and and, you know, people will warn you. People have warned me walking onto the set of shows I'm producing and warning me, oh, look out for this, this director we got, this woman we got the, you know, she's tough. She's tough. And I'm like, I, I've just spent two weeks in prep meetings with this person. They're fine. <laughs> they know what they're doing. I know it's your first day with her, but I don't know what the hell you're talking about. They're like, they're like every other director I'm working with. They come in, they've got a lot of work they need to get done. And they're probably anticipating a lot of blowback from you guys anyway, one way or the other. Hey, she doesn't know what she's doing. That's the, the other side. So it's, you know, it's one or the other. And I think, I think a lot of female directors have decided if it's one or the other, then I'd rather it just be that I come in and do my job and you can call it whatever you want to call it. And I'm sure that's how Kate Jackson felt. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. Yeah, I think she was very um, clear about what she wanted on Scarecrow. And certainly, at least, um, it seems like from from the TV guides. <laughs> <laughs> again, again, you can't argue TV guide. Man, it's there. I got to tell you, this Starlog article about Juanita Bartlett that I found this morning is pretty great. I'll share oh, with you later. I see it. I told her our, star, our Juanita Bartlett story. All right. Today. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for coming on and clarifying. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe right. we'll have you back. Oh God. Anytime you want. I'm dying. I'm, and I'm just, you, you realize I'm just literally 20 feet away. Where just, do you live? I'm just right okay. down the driveway. So any, anytime the two of you want to chat again. All right. Good All to right. know. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's fun to be a mom and it's fun to be a spy. It's fun to be a spy and a mom. It's fun to be a mom and it's fun to be a spy. It's fun to be a spy and a mom. Okay. And um, we're back. Um, it's so exciting that we got to have Richard on. We'll probably have him on again because be he does um, uh, live with me. Um, I want to go back to episode uh, 14 of season one, Dead Ringer. This was written by Juanita Bartlett. And again, I think it's pretty much where she took over the show. I'm not sure. But it was directed by William Wired, um, who was a big Rockford Files director. So I'm pretty sure that Juanita brought, brought him onto the show. And he ends up directing several Scarecrow Mrs. Kings after that. Um, a little bit about Dead Ringer. Um, Amanda must hide a Hungarian defector, Magna Pretka, who happens to look just like Francine, the agent from IFF, in, and she must hide her in her house um, while Lee and Mel Stewart arrange a safe house and keep the Hungarian bad guys away from her. And so there's a lot of like spy, like, you know, intrigue in this one. But mostly the twist here is that while Magna and Amanda are at her house, Magna's really, really unpleasant. And Amanda, who is super nice and cherry, has to be nice to the really, really unpleasant Hungarian defector and that feels very kind of rockford files where where rockford's constantly dealing with um people that are really annoying to him and it it's pretty funny here because in and and uh like at one point magda sort of makes fun of her kids and <laughs> amanda has to defend <laughs> her kids the other thing that i like in, in this episode that also felt like a little bit of a rockford thing was um when lee brings over uh magda um and her her mother's upstairs and her mother's like who's there <laughs> from upstairs and lee is like just just tell her the truth she won't believe you and she does so amanda's like nothing special mom just just a hungarian refugee and she gets away with it and lee's right and that felt like a total rockford line 
Like you could totally see James Garner in a completely different situation saying, tell the truth, she won't believe you. Lee plays is a very different character, so it reads very differently. But there was something about that line that I was like, that feels like a Juanita Bartlett line. There's a little bit more cynicism, but in a fun way. Kind of comes in the show. And it's not, cynicism is probably the wrong word, but uh Things things get a little more spy serious, I think, uh, after this, um, and um, but they also get a little bit um, kind of uh, mildly, and by edgy again, not edgy at all, but because it's a really still very goofy show. It's the nineteen eighties. It's the nineteen eighties after all. But anyway, so I am very excited when Monty and Bartley takes over because you start to see a lot of Rockford names. Um, and, um, she, uh, uh, it's, it's also another female writer comes onto the show, uh, at least writes, you start seeing them. Not a lot. Still no female directors until Kate Jackson takes the helm. But, um. In mentioning Rockford Files, so you're, you're reminding me of one of the things that I always liked about Rockford is it, I mean, there are always, you know, stories about PIs on television, there they're still are to a certain extent. But that one really stepped away a little bit from the formula in some little twist or some little thing that you would not see any other show doing of that ilk. Uh, and things like this, like, yes, it's a Hungarian princess and gosh, she's just not a nice person. That, as you said, that sounds very Rockford and that sounds very much like um, uh, what you would have expected to see on that show. And it gives this show just a little bit extra lift in my opinion to see that so yeah yeah but uh um i also was enjoying the show beforehand so oh, I'm, a, I'm a big like i i think there's a real um interesting uh, formula of success but i think but, but it also yeah. but but um, um, yeah definitely but i think as with any show it has to evolve as as amanda's skills evolve as amanda's experience evolves she's not going to be the same character she was at the beginning and she isn't as by the time we get to the end so it was i, I thought it was kind of a nice evolution if you will of the show as we're starting to take her amanda a little bit more seriously as and showing her skills and and what she brings to the table in doing this new job in some ways, season two is my favorite season. Um, I'm I'm always a big sucker for the first, so it's a it's a tough call because season one, pretty close, a lot of charm. But season two for me, there's just a lot of highlights as well. So next episode, we'll be looking at uh, season two of Scarecrow Mrs. King, and and we'll be talking a little bit about the stunts. Um, uh, the season one and season two stunts were pretty pretty spectacular, and season two suddenly they get very excited about actually shooting in Europe. I'm I want to kind of figure out, I'm gonna try to figure out uh, why they did that. <laughs> <laughs> because it's it's an interesting choice. It's an exciting choice. I mean, it had to be a big budget, you know, uh, to do that. Um, but I don't know whether that was Kate Jackson or um, the the network or somebody going, no, we got to get over there. And it may have had something to do with Remington Steel. I wonder if Remington Steel was doing that because this was very much, I think they were sort of chasing Remington Steel a little bit. Um, and Remington Steel was weirdly chasing them sometimes, it felt like. So our audiography for this episode is, um, I would have two websites and a book to recommend. Um, the book is Where the Girls Are, Growing Up Female with the Mass Media, by Susan J. Douglas. And the websites are Chance Encounters, which is a fan site that has a lot of fan fiction and videos and a lot of love for Scarecrow. Um, it's at chanceencounters.weebly.com. And these will be on our website, of course. And then the other website is Just Walk With Me at justwalkwithme.com. And um, that is, of course, a line that Lee Stetson says to Amanda King in episode one. And that site goes through every episode, but in a very fun and enjoyable way and um, with a lot of love, but also a lot of humor about the 80s and the goofiness of the show. So to wrap up, we have some thank yous for today. We want to give a shout out to our audio engineer, Kevin Ducey, co-producer, Melissa Roth. Thanks, Melissa. Melissa's over there on the microphone correcting yes, me when yes. I get it wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. 
I also want to shout out the guys from Astonishing Legends, Forrest Burgess and Scott Philbrick, who've been very helpful to me in starting this podcast. And our other advisors, Chris Stashu and Mike White from Projection Booth and Culture Cast. These guys have been invaluable resources to us. Check out their podcast if you haven't already. And we want to hear from you. What's the 80s ladies driven TV show that you remember or have heard of or want us to cover? And find out more about us at the website 80stvladies.com. That's 80stvladies.com. And of course, you can follow us on all the social medias. We hope you'll join us for the next episode where we continue our dive into Scarecrow and Mrs. King. We hope 80s TV Ladies brings you joy and laughter and lots of fabulous new and old shows to watch, all of which will lead us forward toward being amazing ladies of the 21st century. That's what you are, Sharon. You too, Susan. Good night.